Amen. If you love the Lord, say amen. Man, we are excited that you're here today. If it's your first time here at the Refuge this morning, we are so thankful to have you. Man, what an incredible time of, of worship this morning. Man, aren't you thankful for all that you've witnessed? I love that song, man. I've seen and I've witnessed it. Amen. This morning, if I could speak to you on a thought, it would just be the importance of the journey. The importance of the journey. A lot of times we find ourselves on journeys and we have no idea where they're going. We have absolutely no idea why God is doing what he's doing. But when you look back and you witnessed what he was doing in that moment or what he accomplished in your life, I don't know that there's anything any better to look back and see the faithfulness of God. So many times you didn't see a way out and he made a way out and it's just amazing at who he is. And this morning I want to share with you the importance of a journey and it's going to be one that um, maybe some of you are going to learn some things for the very first time. Some of us, you maybe you're like me, you've had one interpretation of this particular text and you're going to discover that it didn't mean exactly what you thought at all. <laughs> But in any event today, you're here for a purpose, and this is part of your journey. Whether you've been here for quite some time, or today's the first day you've ever attended here at this service, I don't believe things just happen to be happening. I believe God is in control and in charge of every step, and you're here for a purpose today. And so one of the things that we say here at the Refuge, our goal this year, one of our Things that we're focusing on all year is just getting into the Word. So we've been saying this thing, we're going to get into the Word until the Word gets into us. And people are digging like they've never dug before, and it's exciting to see people in the Word of God and reading their Bibles and having discussions and making disciples. It's just an incredible time uh, to see God at work in our lives. And so if you have your Bible with you this morning, and I hope you do, and if you have your phone or your tablet, whatever, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16 this morning. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read some verses beginning at verse 13, and when you find that, I want you to stand to your feet, find Matthew 16, and when you're ready to get into the Word, say Word. word. Matthew 16, verse 13 through 27 is what we're going to read this morning. The Bible says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Let's pray. Father, today we're so thankful for the journey. Every one of us has got a story to tell. 
We've witnessed you do incredible things, Father, but today we're asking you to open our eyes and our ears. Too often and so often, Jesus said that those who had ears to hear, let them hear. And it's our prayer today, Father, that we would hear the word, your word, Father, and we would hear it maybe through a different set of ears, maybe a clear set of ears and a clear set of eyes today, God, and all our hearts would be open and they would be receptive to what you would have us to do as followers of Christ. And so, Father, today, give us exactly what you would have us to have, and we're going to give you the glory and praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you can be seated. You know, for the last several weeks, we have been preaching, what do you mean, born again? And I know people are saying, like, how long are we going to be talking about being born again? Pastor, I'm born again. We're born again. We love Jesus. I know I'm saved. I'm certainly not one of those people who... Know that I'm saved, but not. I'm convinced that I know Jesus. I'm following Jesus. Well, I hope you're ready for the journey. I hope you're ready for the journey. As we look at this text this morning, and we began to dig this out, I, I've got some points I want to make, but I, I want you to see if you're a note taker. I want you, this is just, the first thing I want you to see, this journey that Jesus is taking these men on is an intentional journey. Whether you believe it or not this morning, the journey you've been on for one year, two years, 10 years, or 75 years, it has been an intentional journey. And as we look at this passage here in the scripture, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? You know, it doesn't seem like much when you read this. It doesn't seem like anything, just a few guys having a conversation. You know, and it never really seemed like a big deal until Wanda and I went to Israel. Until we got to this very place that we're talking of here today at Caesarea Philippi. Before Jesus and his disciples made the journey to Caesarea Philippi, they were in the region of Bethsaida. And we know this, if we read the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is performing the miracles of the healing. He's healing a blind man in Bethsaida. Following this event, he and his disciples, they began to travel to Caesarea Philippi, where this is the, the pivotal moment where in scriptures the narrative is about to change. There's going to be a revelation we'll talk about in just a moment. Peter gets the revelation from God, wouldn't within himself, we just read that, but this is where the narrative is going to change. The discussion, the topic, everything that Jesus has been modeling is going to change as he makes his way to the cross. And so, just telling you a little bit about this, having been there, the journey from Bethsaida to Caesarea Philippi would take about two to three days. They're walking, right? Right? Two to three days of distance between those locations, somewhere between 25 and 30 miles. Given the average walking speed and, and the terrain of this region, it's about a two, to day, a two to three day travel time to get from point A to point B. And so as we got there, I want you to look at some of the pictures we took. This first one right here, this is exactly where we're about to be discussing. If you've ever been to Israel right here, this is exactly where this conversation is taking place. Jesus has brought them to this right here, and to this, just keep that on the screen for just a minute. He's brought them to this, this place at Caesarea Philippi, and I want, you to, I want you to notice what you see right there. It looks like a cave, right? And it, and it is a cave, and it's important that you understand that it is a cave. Let, let go to the next, the next picture, please. This is what it looks like from the side view. This cave that you just saw overhead is right here closest in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And this is what it looks like. What's left of this particular area is exactly what it looks like now. It's incredible. It's an incredible, but it's going to bring a whole other understanding to you as you look at this picture because Caesarea Philippi, right here, Caesarea was the epicenter of paganism. What you see on here was an area where it was a buffet of gods, if you will. They didn't know who the real God was, so they just honored all of them. They didn't understand. And as you look at this picture right here, you can see, go to, could you go to the next one? 
This right here is what it would have looked like back in the day, in Jesus' day as he, he comes. And you can see these little niches or niches in the, in the, etched in the side of the, the mountain there and that's the rock here. And, and every one of those would be a different God. They would be positioned in those window-looking openings, and so they would worship those, those gods as whatever it was that they particularly were known for or they believed them for. They were in those little niches there, and that's, that's what they did. And one of the, the, the ones that stand out the most, we're going to talk about this, that cave there, that you, you see it's behind this building on the left. You can see where the cave is, where the temple is. They believe that was the passage to the underworld. They believed that there was a place where all these gods and people who were both righteous and unrighteous would go. They believed this was the entrance to the underworld. And the, and the centerpiece of this false worship here at Caesarea Philippi was the God Pan. I'm not sure if you, you know or if you heard anything about the God of Pan, but he was half man and half goat. So we have a picture of what he would look like. Go one more, please. Thank you. One more, please. Oh, one more, please. There we go. This is what Pan looked like. They believed he was half goat and he was half man. Not only was he half goat and half man, but he was also known as a fertility god, the god of sex. The people believed that if they engaged in enough sexual activity on that platform where I just showed you, that in all those things that they were doing, they believed that Pan would come back and from the underworld and he would honor them and he would bless their crops and he would bless their homes, their families would grow. All these things happened right there on that platform. Right there on the side of that rock. In the bottom of that cave, if you can imagine, if you know anything about caves, most of the time there's water somewhere. And in the bottom of that cave, you go to the next slide. In the bottom of that cave, now since an earthquake in the early first century, it rerouted the water, but originally in Jesus' day, the water came out of that cave came around the side of that temple and it flowed through and eventually would tie into the Jordan River and, and carry on. But the waters that were there, we understand through science now that they had, they were full of hydrogen and it was almost like it was a continual bubbling down there and it made noises in the cave. And part of the underworld, they thought these gods were talking to them, right? And it gets really weird right here though. They would sacrifice goats and they would throw them into the water. If the blood of the goat remained clear, the water remained clear, the offering was accepted. But if the blood of the goat turned the water red, it was rejected. That sounds kind of weird to us, right? Do you know what they called this pool? Do you know what they called this area here? Not what we call it today. When somebody says the gates of hell or the gates of Hades, we're, we automatically think that that's where Satan lives. But this particular area that you're looking at, that cave and that entrance right there, when Jesus said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, what he was referring to is what the people there knew that cave to be the gates of hell. And so as you hear this today, most believers think today that, that hell is something entirely different, that Jesus meant something entirely different than what he said. When they said the gates of hell, we automatically are thinking Satan, enemy, and we're right in our thought processes. We are, and we'll show that in just a moment. But when Jesus is talking to the disciples and he has them on this journey and he takes them and he says, when he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us, in that moment, they knew exactly what the gates of hell was. 
and it's certainly what, not what we have been taught to believe. Hades was a, the idea of a place where both the righteous and unrighteous were, and it was a holding place until the Messiah returns. And see, how do we know this? Because if you know anything about your Bible, you know that there's a story in your Bible about the rich man and Lazarus. You remember that? They were talking to each other. There's a chasm between them. Abraham is where all the righteous are. The rich man is where all the unrighteous are, and it's a holding place in Hades. This is what they believed. This is where they thought people went. The belief was that Hades is the underworld. It's a place where death, listen, it's going to be so crucial for you to get this. It's a place where they believed that death held you. It'll make sense when Jesus says, death no longer has a hold on you. It was a place to the culture where they believed this is where you went and you were held there until the return of Christ. And I want you to think about this. Jesus has carried the disciples on a two-day journey to this location. And I want you to see this. No Jew in his right mind would go to this place here at Caesarea Philippi. You know what it would be like to us? It would be like Mardi Gras in the red light district on Bourbon Street at midnight. It was the party capital, the place to be, anything you want you can get. And some of the most absurd, evil things that you can think of were happening on the side of that mountain. He takes them there and he asks them, he takes them all through this whole thing. They're standing there and they're looking at all this pagan worship they're, they're, they're looking at all the sexual activity happening out there. They're looking at them worshiping, sacrificing goats, animals, worshiping these, these statues that are up in these niches and, and cut into the side of stone. He's looking at all this. The disciples are looking at all those things. They're looking at the side of that mountain, and he says this, who do they say I am? Who do they say I am? Then he asked a question, who do you say I am? In the midst of all the sin that's taking place in that courtyard, if you want to call it that, who do you say I am? You know, when you think about this and you think about as a family, we've been on a, you know, we see attendance is Great attendance today. The summer attendance is usually down. People are on vacation. We got lots of families out today that are on vacation and been gone this past week. But I want you to think about, imagine planning a trip with a specific purpose in mind, a vacation, and every step of the journey is carefully planned so that you can achieve your desire, so you can find the happiness, whatever makes you happy. Some of you are going to go to Disney World. You're going to do this on this day and this on this day, and you're going to ride this this day, and you're gonna, you've got it all mapped out, right, because it's your journey journey it's your plan it's your vacation it's your time and you know what result you want at the end you ever thought that Jesus is the same way that your life is mapped out why am I going through this trouble pastor why 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 did I get this freedom here why did this happen at this point in my life why, why did these things happen why, why are you got me here God why are you doing this in my life what why are all these steps why am I having to go down this journey See, it's really easy to talk about when we quote Jeremiah and say, I know the plans God has for you, plans for you to prosper and plans for you to be successful and plans for you to succeed. But when it don't feel so successful, what about those plans? What about when somebody's speaking hard truth in my life and I don't want to hear it? What about when it wrecks my plans? What about those plans? Oh, we, we don't want to talk about that, Pastor. We just want to hang on Jeremiah's idea of it success happiness Jesus didn't wander aimlessly think about this he went 30 hours walking and I don't know if you've noticed uh, you see that hillside 
He didn't have a two-lane highway that he was walking down. The mountains are treacherous over there. They're, they're, they're difficult to navigate through. And Jesus is walking, and he intentionally led his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, a place known for its pagan worship, a place known for spiritual darkness. And he was preparing them for a pivotal moment in their understanding, a pivotal moment in his identity, and a pivotal moment in what the mission really is. Unfortunately, you know what? So many people spend very little time planning out their spiritual journey or even thinking that God's got a hand in anything to do with their spiritual life. When in fact, everything you're going through right now has a purpose and it's for a purpose greater than you. So similarly, that God leads us intentionally in our lives. Every trial, every triumph, every moment is part of a divine plan to reveal himself to us, to shape us into his likeness. Listen, are we paying attention to the intentional steps that God's guiding you through right now? Are we paying attention to the intentionality that God really has in our lives? The do's, the don'ts, the breaks, he stops things, he starts things. Are we really paying attention to what God's doing? where God's really leading because the journey's intentional. Not only was the journey intentional, but listen, not only was it really intentional in what Jesus did with the disciples and for us, but this was a revelational journey too. When Jesus asked his disciple about the people's opinion regarding his identity, he receives different answers. You know what he said? Some said John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. These, respect, these responses, they, they reflect the, the confusion, all the speculation that's surrounding Jesus' true nature. Then he turns to his disciples and Peter, inspired by divine revelation, he boldly declares, you're the Messiah. You're, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And then Jesus says this to him. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Think about what's happening in the background. Think about all the sin. Think about what he is seeing as he looks through Jesus and he's looking at what's happening. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Pete. My father in heaven did. Because so often when your eyes, when our eyes and our ears, when things get in front of us, our focus is typically on what we want, what we're seeing, what in that moment. When we begin to hear things, why as a kid, your mama's taught you this little song, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above looking down on us in love. Oh, be careful. Little eyes, be careful little ears. Because too often Jesus will be standing right in front of you talking to you and all you can see is what's going on in the background and all you're concerned about is what's going on over there. I want you to think about the moment Pete was in. Think about what he was looking through as Jesus was talking to him. And Pete had a revelation. In the midst of all this sin, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. In the midst of all this spiritual darkness, Peter's confession shines brightly. I mean, you imagine standing, just standing in front of that cave, all these symbols of false gods and pagan rituals, and proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. And I, I, I wrote this this week. Listen, this was not just a declaration of faith, but it was a bold rejection of all the other gods that was in the area. It was a bold declaration of, I am that, I'm not going to be a part of that God. I see who they're worshiping. I'm not going to be there. It was a bold declaration and a bold rejection of all the other gods, affirming that Jesus is the son of the living God. You know, just as Peter recognized Jesus' true identity, in the midst of a culture that was saturated with all these false beliefs, what do you think we're supposed to be doing? I wonder if there's any false belief in the good or beliefs in the good old U.S. of A. I wonder if there's any paganism that's in this little community in which we live. I wonder if there's anything like this. Can we remotely even minutely think for a moment that what we experience right here 
in our land. Is it not the same? People ain't walking around talking about something that's a half man and half goat. But you rest assured they've got their own God. They've got their own God. We're called to stand firm in our faith amidst a world of competing ideologies and distractions and have to be able to discern and declare the truth of who Jesus is, Savior and Lord. If you were to reflect on your own life just for a moment, in in what way could you boldly proclaim How could you boldly proclaim Jesus' identity in your workplace or in your community or in your family? Do you boldly proclaim Jesus is Lord? He is the son of a living God where you work at. Do you talk about him? You're looking amidst all these ideologies and all this paganism and all these people who have no desire for Jesus, no desire for the church, but you're looking through them, but are you still confessing boldly Jesus is Lord? Man, if you're not, something to learn from Pete this morning. Something to learn from the Word of God. You ever thought about this? You know, have you ever considered a moment when you go to the movies or you go watch a show? I thought about the shows that we've been watching. And as I talked to some of the students this past week that are on our team at the high school and they've got all these shows and I was having a conversation just jokingly with, with Blake's daughters, one of Blake's many daughters, one of Blake's daughters this week, and it, and it got me to thinking, have you ever thought about while you're watching those theater, those Broadway shows, you're watching a movie, whatever you're watching? I remember sitting there this, this, this past year, and I was trying to figure out what's going to happen. I remember watching Sophie and and Ben and all of our people, and I was was like, what's he he going to do? Then one time I saw Ben get a cigarette. I said, he ain't going to light that cigarette, is he? He's not going to light that cigarette. And Lord and behold, he acted like he was smoking it. I missed it. But you're in the movie, you know what I'm talking about. You're in the movie and you're trying to figure out the narrative and then you know all that that feeling. You're, You're watching it and suddenly the plot changes for just a moment. And listen, You get some revelation, you know where it's going, you figured out what's going to happen. You know what that feels like? You get that kind of revelation, you see what's about to unfold. Revelation transforms your understanding and your perspective. When you get a revelation about something, especially from God through his word, however, Holy Spirit, however it's revealed to you, when you get a true revelation of God, your understanding and perspective changes. You know, Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ was not just an intellectual realization, but it was a divine revelation from the Father. It's what the word says. You know, in our spiritual journey, You know that you and I, we need moments of revelation where God opens our eyes to a deeper truth. And the only time we find those deeper truths about who he is and and, and who we are in him, those revelations come in times of prayer. They they come in times of fasting, studying the word, moments of worship like we just experienced. I just want to ask you this morning, are you positioning yourself to receive those kind of revelations from God? Do you ever find yourself in a posture to really hear from the Lord? Last thing I want you to see this morning is not only was it intentional and revelational, man, it was transformational. It was a transformational journey. In that passage in Matthew 16, he says this, and I say to you, I say also say to you, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And man, this has been jacked up in so many teachings, it ain't even funny. I wonder why it is, and I understand this, but I wonder why it is, and Satan is not uh, omnipresent. But when you have all these churches, we get in together, and I'm going to be careful right here, right? Be careful. I'm going to wreck some of your theology. But you get in here, and, and you have all these people. We're going to bind Satan. You're going to bind Satan. 
a lot of times I'm wondering, did we get him bound? If we got him bound in here, then the church down the street shouldn't have to be fighting him in the service, right? And this ideology that comes out, taking this passage out of context and using it the wrong way, man, it really wrecks a lot of people's understanding of who Jesus really is. People who walk around and just say, hey, I'm, I'm going to bind this and I'm binding that and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and have no understanding of what the word really means or says, do you make yourself look really silly. And you're doing damage to the kingdom of God because you're teaching people to do things that Jesus didn't do. However, we're going to talk about that a little bit next week too. This is where Jesus says, I will build my church on this rock and the gates of of hell will not prevail against it. You know, there's a lot of people that think Peter's the rock. There's a lot of religions and ideologies that believe Peter's the rock. I'm going to build it on you, Peter. You know, Peter was a flawed man. I can name three times he failed for sure. So Jesus is going to build the, the church on somebody that, that, that experiences failure, that's, that's liable to fail again, right? He's going to build the church on something that's going to deny him, something that's going to walk away, something that's... No. No, he's not. I mean, let, let's don't over-spiritualize it right here, right? He called him a Petra. I don't want to get into this right here, right? But when he referred to Peter, he called him a Petra, which is like just a little bee rock. So I, I don't know. Could you throw that cave or that picture back up there? Could, could he be talking about little bee Petra rock? Or, or could he be, by chance, be talking about that hillside that he's looking at that's called the gates of hell. And listen, could he be talking about that everything beneath me is under my feet? Everything is under my feet. I will build the church on top of this and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Christ purposely took his disciples to this evil pagan place to show him that his church would be so powerful that the gates of hell would not be able to prevail or stand against it because they knew what the gates of hell represented. They understood. Man, I looked at this wrong for so many years. It was always taught that evil was going to get so bad, the world's going to get so bad, it's going to feel like you're being overcome by the devil and Satan's all the time winning. And all, listen to me, the fight's already won, man. The victory's already won. So many people feel like we're fighting to the cross when in fact we're fighting from it. The victory's already been won. You know that gates, I believe this is what Jesus is saying here, that the gates of Hades was the holding place for death. That's what they believed. And you know what gates were used for in the ancient world? They were used for defensive purposes. They were used to keep an enemy from entering a certain place. But what does a gate really do? Think about what a gate really does. It not only keeps people on the outside, listen to me, glad to see my, my brother, my brother DJ here this morning, been serving some alongside with him on Saturdays. He has an understanding. A gate will shut the door for people who are on the inside as well as the people who are on the outside. Not only does it keep somebody from getting in, it confines people from getting out. When you shut the door on that jail cell or you shut the door on the gate at your house, it, it'll keep somebody from getting in, but it keeps somebody from getting out. And when you think about that this morning, you think about the gates of Hades has held people for a long time. You know why? Because of the enemy, because of sin, because of the destruction of the world, because of, of what I've done. This is where Jesus is because of what he's done. He's telling them, because of what I'm going to do, the narrative is about to change. How do I know that? I read it to you. He's about to tell them, I got to go die. The narrative is going to change. But this is what he's saying. Because of what I'm going to do, the gates of hell are not going to contain you, and it's not going to keep anybody trapped in any longer. It will not prevail against the church. For you and I, you're thinking, well, maybe it sure feels like it. This conversation Jesus is having is not about encouraging the disciples. 
It's not about giving them a passive mentality. You know what it's about? This is about giving them an active mindset about going after and advancing the kingdom of God. The gates of hell are not going to stop you. It's not going to stop the church, not those gates, not any other gate. It is not going to stop the advancement of the kingdom. You know, contrary to what some people might believe, the church is not on defense in a stationary mode standing its ground. It's not designed to be on the defensive side. You say, well, why, why does it feel like it's on the defensive side? You've heard this saying because most churches in America right now are concerned about these four walls, these four and no more. That's what they're concerned about. Churches will keep you beat down. I'm just being honest with you. They'll keep you beat down. What is it they say? Busted and disgusted? Where's Daniel at? They'll keep you broke, busted, and disgusted, right? We don't want you to excel. We don't want you to exceed. We just want you to do, conform to what we want you to do, what we want you to be. We're not making disciples. We're not doing any of those things. That's why it feels like we're on the defense. We're on the defensive side of the ball. It was never intended to be that way. Jesus took these places to this pagan, evil place to show them that not any evil they were seeing, hearing, or experiencing in that moment would stop the advancement of the gospel. And he uses, I, I love this. What do we use? What do we use to push back on this darkness? I love it. Man, I'm the light of the world. You tell me you ain't got enough light. We don't have enough light inside of us to push back against the darkness, to push back against the evil. Something's missing if we feel this way. What it really means is the church, church, we should be on the offense. The gates of hell are not going to be able to withstand its entry. It's not going to be able to stand, withstand its power. And God has designed his church to be in the world. We're not of it, but we're in it. And what are we supposed to do while we're here? I've been preaching about being born again for so many weeks, but I want to ask you, has there really been a tra transformational experience? Did you really get revelation in that moment that you prayed that prayer? Did you really get a revelation of who Jesus Christ really is? If you really got that revelation of who he is, listen, there's no transformation, there's no salvation. This was transformative in, in Peter's life when he understood when he really understood who and what Jesus was saying, what he was asking him to do, you say, well, he didn't understand it immediately. No, he didn't. Jesus, we're not doing this. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, man. You ain't got a clue. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have a clue. You don't have a clue. I want you to think about this. I used this yesterday while the worship team comes up. I used about this yesterday. In one of the sessions we taught, have you ever really thought about just how metamorphosis really works? Have you ever really thought about that little thing we call a caterpillar? You know, they got a tough life. Either one of my boys saw them whenever they were growing up. They stomped them. That's what boys do. That's what boys do. Never had a chance at life. But have you ever thought about that caterpillar? Have you ever thought about what happens when it goes through that process and it gets in that cocoon? Have you ever really thought about it? Do we know what it turns into when it comes out of that? It turns into a butterfly. Listen to me. It no longer has to crawl on the ground. It doesn't have to look at the same things with the same perspective any longer. It went from crawling on its belly to now it's flying above all the things 
that are beneath it. It learns how to soar above everything that was a part of the journey in its life to get it to that transformative spot. But listen to me. Here's one thing it doesn't do. That butterfly doesn't go back to being a caterpillar. It doesn't go back to crawling on its belly. May have some other things happen to it. It's not going to get stepped on and squished. It's got a different perspective with its life. Sees things a little bit different because God changed it into something beautiful, something incredible, allowed it to rise above all the circumstances in its life. And it just floats gracefully. You know, it's, it's, it's for a lot of things, a lot of reasons, it's a lack of understanding of the most simplest things in life. It's crazy how Jesus didn't give three-point sermons, didn't have a dry erase board, didn't have screens or a worship band. It's crazy that when they brought before him a woman caught in the act of adultery, that all he, all he did was just get down. I don't know what he drew, neither do you and neither do they. But whatever he took his finger and drew with in the sand was so profound that everybody there that was condemning that lady dropped their rock and walked away. Simple. Simple. And as you think about this transformation in Peter's life from a fisherman, from a fisherman, we're going to learn a lot the next few weeks. How in the world could somebody walk by and say, hey, come follow me, and a man drop everything and leave right then? How is that even possible? See, you need to know what he came through before he got to that moment. The journey. It was a journey that led up to somebody who when a rabbi walked by and said, come follow me. Because up to that point, Peter didn't make the cut. Why was he so eager to follow? Because of the journey that led up to that point. You know, why are some people so fired up in Jesus and so fired up about the Holy Spirit and so receptive to the moving of God and so respect, respect, receptive to the Word of God and just can't get enough? They're like sponges. Can I tell you why? It's because of the journey. It's because God did something in their life so profound, so transformative. You think, take a fisherman that becomes a foundational leader in the early church that made sure that you and I got this book to us today over 2,000 years later. Transformative, transformational. I mean, a foundational leader who demonstrated the power of God and what a changed life really looks like. Jesus gave Peter a new identity. He gave him a new purpose. And in the same way your encounter, my encounter with Jesus, they are meant to transform you the same way. I'm not talking about something that's just a casual change. We're talking about from a caterpillar to a butterfly, that's a radical change. We're talking about from a, from a fisherman to a foundational leader full of the Holy Spirit and power that's willing to die for the cause, that's a radical change. What's our change look like? What does our change look like? Man, I love the fact that our encounters with Jesus are meant to transform us, that he will take our old selves with all of our flaws, all of our failures, make us new creations, empowering us to fulfill his purposes. I want to ask you this morning, are we really allowing Jesus to change us in this magnitude? Is the journey we've been on, are we at a point in our life where we're ready to say, Jesus, man, do with me whatever you will. Can you imagine, Abraham, I need you to go. Where are we going? How long are we going to be there? What's it going to be like? Nope. 
Abraham, I need you to go. Need somebody to go. Lord, here I am. Just send me. I don't need no details. I, I don't need to know nothing. Let's just go. The power, the transformational power. And this morning that the Holy Spirit, I believe, wants to use on us. You know, since we've pressed in and we've got this, we're working hard to get discipleship processes in place because there's people here, there's people all around me that want to manipulate, they want to lie, they want to cheat, they want to deceive, they want to do all those things. You're always going to have those people with you. You're always going to. And the harder we press in, the more they're sticking their heads up. But you know what? That's how it's supposed to be. Jesus said they hated me, they'll hate you. But on the other side, I'm not going to focus on all this. I'm going to address it and keep stepping. But on the other side over here, there's a group of people that are hungry for a move of God. They want to see the power of God. They want their lives transformed. They want to see this community transformed. They want to see the power of the Holy Spirit like never before. You know what? As we focus on those things, I just expect Jesus. I just expect the Holy Spirit. He probably saying, it's about time. It's about time somebody wanted to make disciples. It's about time somebody got serious in their walk with Christ. It's about time. You've been looking at all this evil, all this paganism. It's on the TV. Listen, you realize they're spending millions of dollars every day to keep you as a follower of Christ off course. And you know what's keeping us all off course? Our eyes and our ears. That's it. Our eyes and our ears. Click, scroll, stop. Millions of dollars. It's no different. It's no different than Jesus looking at Pete and all that paganism, all the things that were happening on that side of that mountain that day. No different in saying, hey, Pete, who am I to you? Who am I to you? Who am I? You know, the beauty of this today is you and I can draw strength and confidence from knowing that we are part of this church. We are part of the unshakable, victorious church that Jesus is talking about right here. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. So when you're faced with challenges and persecutions and doubts, I need you to remember this morning, if your foundation is Christ, then you need to... You need to live like you believe that your foundation is Christ. And it's a firm foundation. And no matter what the enemy throws at me, listen, Jesus has already said it's not going to prevail against me. If the enemy this morning's knocking you down and knocking you down and knocking you down and knocking you down and you don't want to get back up, you need to refocus this morning. I want to ask you a question. Who is Jesus to you? Because he's already fought this fight. He's already won this. And maybe, maybe if the followers of Jesus would go on the offensive right here, do you know how many people we need to bust through the gates of hell right now and snatch out of there? Do you know how many people that are in bondage right now? That Listen, you have the ability to go over their house. You don't have to live like that anymore. Jesus paid a way for you. You don't have to live like this. Come out from the sin. Come out from the drugs and the alcohol. Come out from the adultery. Get out of that. You don't have to do this anymore. You and I have the ability to walk in and walk straight through the gates of hell and snatch people out. We have that. Oh, really? Well, the Bible says greater is he that's in you than anything is in this world. But what the world is seeing is everything else is what's great in our life. That's what they're seeing. This morning, you're part of something that's unstoppable. Unstoppable. It doesn't matter what Satan tries to do. He cannot stop. The church and Jesus has already triumphed over sin and death. So this morning, could you just take a moment and reflect on the areas of your life where you feel overwhelmed, where you feel attacked? And can you trust this morning that you can rely on this foundation? This foundation. Listen, on this, this, this foundation. This morning, 
As we close, man, we're reminded of these truths, recognizing and confessing Jesus as the Messiah. That's where it started. He recognized Jesus for who he is. He recognized. This morning, if this group of people, dude, he just had 12. If this many people would just recognize that Christ is our firm foundation. On Christ's solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. If we understand this truth right here and we recognize it and we confess where we really are, we build our lives upon this revelation, we're going to stand victorious against all other adversaries. And you can go forth today. You can go boldly today proclaiming Jesus is the Lord of your life. You can draw your identity. You can draw your strength from an unshakable foundation right here, right now. Not TikTok. Not what's happening politically. Not what everybody else has done. Not the traditions of a man. So I guess the question is today, how can you faithfully live out these truths? How can you do it? What do you got to shift? What do you got to move? Because I believe just as Jesus asked Pete that day, all the evil in the world happening. Pete, who do these people say I am? If you were to ask your friends at school, students, Hey, who is Jesus? Oh, they're going to say the right answer. It's going to be a church and knees answer. You ask your people at work, hey, who, is, who, who do these people say that I am? And you would say, I've never heard that person say anything about you. I've, I've never heard that person say, this person says, that person says. It's no different than saying, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say this. But then who do you say Jesus is? Your journey that you've been on, journey you've been on, man, there should be no denying who Jesus the Christ is. No denial whatsoever. As you reflect on that this morning, what's what's the next step in your journey? Can you be intentional right here in this moment? Jesus was intentional. I believe in this time of invitation, if you're intentional with what you want from God, I believe you'll get a revelation of what you need to do. And I believe if you do it, your life will be transformed. So what's he saying to you? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word and your truth. Thank you, Father, today that you are intentional with everything you do. Every step I take, it's a step, God, that you've ordained. Every breath we take is a breath that you've ordained. And God, we live in a chaotic world. It's full of chaos and turmoil and so much evil. There's so many gods and so many idols. And the people in this world are no different now than they were then. But God, we can be different through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can stand firm. We can be bold. And God, if we're born again and that transformation is really there, we will be. We will be. We may be just like Pete in the beginning. We may not understand. There may be some things you have to teach us along the journey that we've been on. But at the end of the day, I pray that we all can not only profess and confess, but we would, having lived a life that would show that Jesus is the living God, son of the living God. And everyone around us knows it. God, today, would you just raise up a group of people that would be willing to storm the gates of hell and just tear them down? To go in and take back what the enemy's stolen. And those people who think there's no way out, Satan's lied and deceived and tricked. There's no way out. I'm always going to be this person. I'm always going to be trapped in this moment. I'm always going to be behind these gates. I'm always going to be locked in the prison of my mind. God, can today be a day where we're willing to go and just show them that gate's open. 
that gate's open. All you got to do is walk out of it. We love you today, Jesus. Speak to our hearts in a way that only you can. And we give you the glory and the praise for today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? It's your time. The best thing you can do is be obedient in this moment.